This is the Rock and Roll Autopsy Podcast. All right, I'm going to zap her again. Charge up the paddles. Come on, let's go, let's go. Sorry, don't. Hold the compressions. Clear. Straight line. Good evening and welcome to Rock and Roll Autopsy. We are the forensic files on your radio dial. My name is Scott. And have we got a great show for you tonight? No, we don't. Damn it. The phone is ringing again. It's the request line. All right, let's pick it up. WRNRA, East of the Rockies. Hey, Breather, what's going on, man? You can't understand why the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is located in Cleveland, Ohio? (laughs) Yeah, you're probably not alone. I'm sure a lot of people don't know why Cleveland is considered the rock and roll capital of the world. What do you mean it's definitely the capital of shitty rock and roll podcast? Listen, you called the request line. Is there a song you'd like us to perform an autopsy on? I said, <laughs> Mongoloid by Devo? You got it. All right, buckle up, gang. The subject of our rock and roll autopsy tonight will be Mongoloid by Akron Art Rockers Devo. It's episode one of our multi episode deep dive into Midwest Rust Belt rock and roll. So get your pierogi and Parma pink flamingos ready. We're going to find out if Cleveland killed rock and roll. From high atop the Television 8 building, in the best location in the nation, on the shores of beautiful Lake Erie. You don't live in Cleveland. Cleveland! Bumble. Bumble. Hello, Cleveland! Hello, Cleveland! In Cleveland! Breaking news! What is this garbage you're watching? I want to watch the news. This is the news. All right, gang, we've got our intrepid rock and roll beat reporter on the line, Rico Gnu. Rico, how are you, sir? Hey, man, I'm awesome. And let me also bring back into the lab our good friend Mark from Songs That Don't Suck. Mark, how the fuck are you tonight, buddy? Oh, excellent, man. I'm so glad to be back with y'all. I had such a good time the last time. I was so happy to be asked back. Man, anytime. It's a pleasure having you back. You're going you're gonna to help us uh, talk about Cleveland, man. Um, hey, listen, when... Uh, what do you I'm, I'm just wondering what do you think the people out th- i know what we think of when we think of cleveland but i'm wondering what other people think of like when they think of cleveland ohio probably most of them are going to say yeah the burning river thing right <laughs> yes we've fucking lit our river on fire 13 different times over a hundred year period because it was so freaking polluted that is a true story and that's what most people are going to think of however what most people aren't going to think of is rock and roll and that's why we're talking about this tonight the rock and roll hall of fame is in cleveland and i bet most people already know that that's captain obvious stuff but how many people do you think know why the rock and roll hall of fame is in cleveland and that's going to be where we're going to start tonight we're going to start with the birth of rock and roll last episode scott i got to sit on your lap when you were telling stories why don't you guys hop up on my lap both you guys i got there's room for both 
I thought you'd never ask. Swing, swing, tenth pull. <laughs> one on one leg, one on the other. Come on, you guys can even hold hands if you want to. Way back, once upon a time, back in the late 40s, there was this guy named Alan Freed, and he was a local radio DJ with WAKR, which still exists. And he got to know a guy named Leo Mintz who ran a very popular local record store called Rendezvous Records. And the two got to know each other. And uh, before Alan Freed moved over to WJW radio station, which is now our local Channel 8 TV station that does all the Fox stuff, um, one day, you know, over the course of that period of time, he was like, hey, man, we're getting a lot of white kids that are coming into the record store and buying a lot of records by the black artists like the dominoes and fats domino and all of those really great rhythm and blues people and he's like hey man you should play this stuff on your radio station and so alan freed started doing that and during the late 40s and into the early 50s he he had a show dedicated to just playing um this type of music and it was gaining huge popularity um over that time period um and and he had to name this something right we know it as rock and roll but how did he come up with the name rock and roll well the generally accepted story is that in the song 60 minute man by the dominoes there's a line in there about rocking and rolling all night and so he denies this actually for obvious reasons but that's the generally accepted story is that he got the term rock and roll from the song 60 minute men and actually the term rock and roll back then was a term that was used for having sex so he used the term for sex to refer to this genre of music and so this rebellious rock and roll that was subverting societal norms and all that it wasn't something that slowly happened over time this i mean rock and roll came right out of the gate rebellious debaucherous subversive everything that's ever been rock and roll in its worst and at its best started right from the beginning and it was so freaking popular the very next year he put together this show, which is widely considered to be the very first rock concert in March of 1952. It was a five act show at the Cleveland Arena. Um, and, and like rock and roll, it's so very rock and roll of, of this to happen that at the very first rock and roll show, they had to shut it down early because it was overcrowded and there were riots. And so right out of the gate, rock and roll was rock and roll. But a lot of people want to know why the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is, is in Cleveland. And do you guys think that's enough to justify the Hall of Fame being in Cleveland? Mark, do you have a thought on that? Honestly, it's, it's probably a, a little flimsy because he might not have originated it. Um, but... You know, you can make arguments that it could be in New Orleans because it's kind of like where the jazz, uh, you know, kind of got its kickoff. I mean, back then it was referred to as race music. So it was it was music that was happening in African-American neighborhoods, Af African-American culture. Um, so the fact that it dropped itself in Lily White Cleveland because some white DJ on the radio said rock and roll, maybe it's questionable. But uh you know, it is what it is, I guess. Um, but but uh, in, on the flip side of that coin, when you think about the revolutionary idea of the 50s on quote unquote white radio stations playing race music, like he was a trendsetter. He was very rock and roll in that sense of the definition. So, yeah, why the hell not? Let's put it in Cleveland. Um, did you say that the term rock and roll is about sex it is isn't that the best part about it and did you say it originated in a song called 60 minute man yes that is correct wouldn't it more accurately be 60 second man am i right guys <laughs> that would be a more accurate representation 
I always thought, like, the Cleveland thing, for one thing, I actually am elderly enough to remember when there was all this sturm and drang about who was going to get the Rock Hall and who was in the running. And as I recall, the city of Cleveland put together a coalition to lobby super hard to bring the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame to Cleveland. And I think the Alan Freed thing was the selling point. But as I recall, it was also a lot of it was tied up to uh, WMMS and their successes in their glory days of uh, breaking acts like, of course, Rush and Bruce Springsteen, not breaking Bruce Springsteen, but being critical in his you know, early days, David Bowie, others, of course, rock and roll, uh, rock and roll, uh, MMS won that poll in Rolling Stone multiple years in a row, which turned out to ultimately be rigged, I think. And back in the day, Cleveland was really well known. Um, was it the Hyatt House Hotel? where a lot of crazy stuff went down. Like it was kind of folklore about how awesome Cleveland was for touring acts to come through. And Cleveland had the World Series of Rock, which took place in Cleveland Municipal, Municipal Stadium. And it was this huge, you know, Lollapalooza-like festival before Lollapalooza existed, where you'd get multiple, you know, big bands of the day on the same bill, whether it was Journey, Ted Nugent, whatever, you know, and you'd have a giant bill and it would sell out that 83, you know, 80, 80,000 seat arena there. But the Midwest in general was super huge for rock music, right? Detroit Rock City, Cleveland, Ohio, the whole kind of uh, the lake region of the country was super big for rock music. Yeah, and just a random fun fact that I just remembered. Uh, back when the Rock Hall opened, if you remember, we had the huge concert that kind of opened the Rock Hall at the Muni Stadium. I was backstage for that concert. So when I, when I was in college, I did a lot of special event work and I got picked to be part of the crew that helped do some of the setup. And then they kind of gave us lanyards and we got to hang out backstage. So like I bumped into t uh, uh, Kenny Arnoff, who was drumming for uh, was it Melon Camp at the time. Um, it was amazing to, to be backstage for that. Yeah, I can that's imagine. crazy, man. Yeah, Arnoff's been around the block a few times, hasn't he? He's, he's drummed for just about everybody. Yeah. But I think it's in the news again because they just released their nominees for this year. And I saw that Billy Corgan came out and said that they should change the name. It should be the Music Hall of Fame. And I've heard that many, many times. Rico's a big advocate of that. I am not because to me, it's like if you're going to call it the Music Hall of Fame, then get it the hell out of Cleveland because the really the only way it makes sense being in cleveland is if you stick to the brand rock and roll otherwise it has no business being here you can put it in new york you can put it in new orleans to your point you can put it anywhere else the only thing that cleveland is clinging to to have any ownership of this museum is the phrase rock and roll was allegedly reportedly to rico's news segment coined in cleveland ohio once you change the name to me it has no business being here yeah, and I will I will argue that it absolutely should be the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame because if you think about the 50s when it, rock and roll was first rock and roll, it was piano driven and saxophone led. And when we think about rock traditionally now, it's electric guitars and bass and drums. Now, I think rock and roll has become more of an umbrella because of the attitude rather than the actual genre. I think the genres are so fragmented, it's hard to say, okay, this is a rock, rock act and this is not. Um, so it just makes sense to kind of leave it as is, leave it whole as an umbrella, because a lot of the, like, think about Public Enemy, right? They did collabs with Anthrax. Run DMC did collabs with Aerosmith. There's a lot of crossover that happens. There's a lot of influence, a lot of sampling. It all rocks, right? It's just, right. you know, it has a different audience and some people don't like it and whatever, but it's all music. Yeah, I, um... I honestly think that the reason why the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame has expanded the umbrella of what is rock and roll, because if you look at the first decade or so of inductees, it was pretty consistent. But I think they open it up to pop and hip hop and the other genres that people really seem to be troubled by getting into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I think the real reason why the Rock Hall has opened it up is I think that 
and I think I've said this in this podcast before, that if you look at Graceland, Graceland is in trouble because the people who give a shit about going to Graceland are passing away. And so They're dying. Graceland is in trouble. And so what does Graceland look like 25 years from now? Is there anybody on the planet who will be alive and have any interest in going to Graceland, right? So the Rock Hall, I think, accurately looks around, reads the tea leaves and says, you know what? Rock music isn't super popular. And there, it's not, it doesn't own the cultural zeitgeist like it once did. It's not as popular with young people. And if you project when Gen Xers and boomers are gone, and and you know the 40 something millennials now the older millennials when they're when they're gone 25 30 years from now who's going to buy tickets for the rock hall if you're still working on inducting foreigner in there you know what i mean it's like at the end of the day they have to think about box office and so they have to put artists in the rock hall today they have to put jay-z in they have to because how are they go- how are they going to matter to people who are 20 years younger than I am. You know what I mean? It's about projecting ticket sales, box office into the future. It'll be extinct. It'll become Graceland if you don't open it up to genres that young people actually listen to. I mean, which is precisely why I agree with Billy Corgan, and I've mentioned it here before, which is why they should call it the Music Hall of Fame for that particular reason alone. If you're putting Jay-Z in the Rock Hall of Fame, that doesn't really make sense. And if that means getting it the hell out of Cleveland, then it doesn't really belong here anyways then. It put it somewhere where it makes sense. Put it, put it in a central location and have different little pods for each little genre of music. Have the country section or the jazz section or the classical section, the rock and roll section, the punk section, the, the R&B section, whatever you want to do. Make it like a real complex instead of f- faking everybody out, being ridiculous, keeping it the Rock Hall of Fame and putting rap artists in there instead of doing the right thing and calling it the music hall of fame which i agree with him completely on that but it doesn't encompass all music that's the thing like you've got folks like louis armstrong billy holiday who are in as early influencers but like jazz musicians in general are not inducted into the rock hall Um, i think the same can be said for a lot of country artists like you have some early influencers probably but uh as far as like You know, Garth Brooks is not going into the Rock Hall. Mm -hmm. Um, They put in Dolly Parton, but she's an icon, I think. And she didn't want it, admittedly, like she didn't want it. Um, So it's it's really interesting. Like if we start putting in world music musicians, right? So like uh, Ravi Shankar, who plays sitar, like big in the Indian music scene. Like, are we going to put him in? Like if we start to see that happen then yeah, I think we can make the argument for a music hall of fame. But there are other like subgenre mu- museums that exist. The Hip Hop Hall of Fame is opening in Brooklyn. Um, Country Music Hall of Fame is in Nashville. Uh, I'm sure there are others that I am unaware of. I'm pretty sure there's a blues museum in Chicago. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. Unless we really broaden and blow the walls out, I, d- I don't know that making the name change makes sense. Well, and, and how many uh, artists that are looking at guys like Jay-Z or Dolly Parton and saying, hey man, they have no business being there. I am just as relevant as they are and I'm not getting asked to be in the Rock Hall of Fame. If we had a music Hall of Fame, fine. If If it's not in Cleveland, I don't really give a crap. But have a music Hall of Fame, then, you know, people can go to the museum and learn about Miles Davis or they can learn about that guy that plays the sitar that you just mentioned or they could they could learn about all of these people that are never going to be in the Rock Hall of Fame and they're not going to go to the little teeny hip hop Hall of Fame they have this big giant cool complex where they can learn about rap oh and they could walk 100 feet that way and go learn about Miles Davis all in the same day how fucking cool would that be but to Scott's point no, nobody's going to learn about Indian sitar players to the Music Hall of Fame unless it's in some giant city like a New York or an L.A. or Chicago where people are going for other things. Like people come to Cleveland to go to the Rock Hall. And I think having it expanded into kind of the pop, hip hop, you know, blues, 
Oh, oh, I'm not disagreeing with you. If you wanted to expand it like that, it would have no business being here in Cleveland. Yeah. It'd have to be in a. Di it'd have to be somewhere else because I think that somebody like the 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 sitar guy. What's his name again? R Ravi Shankar. Ravi it Shankar. That guy would benefit from somebody going for somebody else because they would just while i'm there let's go check this out and you see what i'm saying i'm not saying that it has to be in cleveland i'm saying let's make it bigger than just the rock hall is what i'm trying to say i think that i would probably not favor like just a giant umbrella i think it's like you can do you can tell one story really well or you can tell a hundred stories half ass and I would rather like this one be the rock hall. And I'm okay if they induct pop and rap artists because I see enough cross pollination and ultimately they all share the same common ancestor, right? It's like evolution, right? So they all, you know, share, you know, what is it? Aus Australopithecus afarensis, right? Is that, did I butcher that bad enough? You know, that, that common Lucy, right? They all share well that. Well done, doctor. Right? So, so they all share Lucy right and it all comes out from that so i think it's okay as long as you don't to to mark's point go too far out you know i think you can make an argument like i was listening on radio the other day and uh no sleep till brooklyn came on by beastie boys and i don't know what do you consider beastie boys hip-hop rock they, i don't they, know they started as a punk band yeah they were a punk right. band but they're in the rock okay. hall right and that's a song that's got carrie king playing guitar on it it's Produced by Rick Rubin. And I swear to God, when you hear the solo, it sounds like it came right off of Rain and Blood by Slayer. It's the same <laughs> atonal, chromatic, half ass pentatonic stuff with the wang bar that Carrie King does. And then the end of it, as it as it kind of fades, just becomes noise, just a wall of noise, just like Rain and Blood does. I mean, there's there's literal like overlap between the Beastie Boys and like Slayer, the most extreme metal, you know, and there's total musical commonality at work there. So, you know, I don't know, man. I want to see the Rock Hall stay in Cleveland. I'm pro Cleveland. Why would anyone who's from here advocate for the Rock Hall, Rico, being removed from Cleveland, Ohio? Come on, man. Hey, in a, in a perfect world, it would be the Music Hall of Fame and it would be in Cleveland but I can't have my cake and eat it too. So if I can't have my cake and eat it too, then let's fucking keep it the rock hall and let's keep it in Cleveland because guess what? Let me get, let me bring in a good parallel here. Um, a lot of people probably don't, you could probably make an argument that the football hall of fame should be somewhere else, right? It's in Canton, Ohio. Why is it in Canton, Ohio? Because football was invented in Canton, Ohio. That's the only reason that it's there. It's certainly not be it's it's certainly not because of our glorious amazingly disappointing Cleveland Browns football team. It's not because of that. It's because football was invented in Canton, Ohio, while rock was invented in Cleveland. So for the same reason that the can't that the Pro Football Hall of Fame is in Canton is the same reason that the Rock Hall of Fame is in Cleveland. Yeah, and right? flight started in Ohio too. Screw you, North Carolina. Yeah, fuck you. Fuck you! Fuck you! The Wright brothers were from fucking Ohio, okay? That's right. We're claiming everything tonight. Screw it. Fuck you! Why don't we take a quick break, and when we come back for the first of our Cleveland series, we're going to talk about one of the locals here, Devo, Mongoloid. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Looking for a good rock and roll book? Do you watch a ton of rock and roll documentaries like I do? Well, that's why I started the Rock Talk Studio podcast. It'd be the place to go for previews, reviews, and recommendations of rock and roll books, documentaries, and movies. Every first Tuesday of the month, the Rock Talk Studio gets you caught up on all the latest and points out where to go for the good stuff. Give me 20 minutes and I'll get you caught up on the world of rock and roll books, docs, and movies from every possible angle and leave you with a no doubt decision on where to spend your time and money fan or just casual fan or maybe you're on the fence and just looking for something new to check out either way i got you covered recently on the show i've talked about books and documentaries from everyone and everything from david bowie randy rhodes and the allman brothers to the abbey road studios cheap trick stevie ray vaughn little richard and more join me big rick every tuesday of the month as i host the rock talk studio podcast the ultimate review of rock and roll books documentaries and movies 
Our Mind on Music is a podcast that covers all things music. We cover all genres and we welcome all perspectives from musicians, producers, and content creators to music enthusiasts. We have discussions, interviews, opinions, and much, much more. We hope you'll join us every week. Our Mind on Music on YouTube and all streaming platforms. What's up, music nerds? Are you tired of wading through a sea of mediocre music, desperately seeking to find a glimmer of greatness? You're in luck. My name is Mark, and I am the host of the podcast, Songs That Don't Suck. Each week, I scour the depths of new music playlists to unearth hidden gems that defy the trends and deliver pure sonic bliss. No matter the genre, if it doesn't suck, it's on my radar. So find us on your favorite podcast platform and subscribe today. And as always, keep searching for and listening to Songs That Don't Suck. We are gathered here to remember rock and roll. Rock was born the rambunctious son of country, western, and blues. In the year of our Lord, 1955, on this day, the birth of rock and roll, gifted under the world a gyrating pelvis, a throbbing beat, and a pulsating rhythm, a sound so infectious and rollicking that it would endow previously scrupulous young minds with identity, individualism, and purpose, thus setting forth a multi-generational pursuit of all that is loud, debaucherous, and unholy. But, sadly, like all earthly endeavors, rock too must perish. Oh, we mourn the loss of rock and roll, with its ridiculously old standard bearers still on tour and charging ungodly amounts of mad jack to witness their long past the sell by date asses on stage and with its chauvinism, misogyny and whiteness no longer aligning with modern sensibilities and with its aging, fist shaking fan base kicking every would-be rocker off their proverbial lawn, rock has indeed passed into the celestial void. May rock rest in peace in eternal cacophonous slumber. Amen. Thank you for that, Scott. You are listening to the Rock and Roll Autopsy Podcast. The Autopsy Report. Hey, welcome back. Um, I want to say thanks to everybody on this planet and maybe any other planets that might be tuning in and listening to us do this. It's very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So what happens when you're an art student or any kind of a student at Kent State in the early 70s? Um, You're just coming off uh you're just coming off the vietnam war protests oh and by the way there's a really infamous shooting at your campus where four young people got shot um you know you become really you know negative and have a lot of cynical feelings about that so what do we do scott we form a band that's exactly what we do we form a band we call ourselves devo and we channel all of our cynicism about how we feel about society through our music which is exactly what they did. So tonight, we're going to talk about the song Mongoloid, which is their first single, originally released as a single, B-side Jocko Homo, but then released on the album, um, on the album um, Are We Not Men, We Are Devo in 1977. Uh, Jerry Cassell and the immensely creative Mark Mothersbaugh wrote the song. Um, we're going to find out if it killed rock, dude. All right, Rico. We still got Mark with us from Songs That Don't Suck. Mark, say hi. Hi. All right, gang. So, Devo, Mongoloid. I'm blown away, Rico, that you say this was the first single off the record. Could you imagine a world today with a track where a song named Mongoloid would be someone's attempt at like a first single isn't like a first single off your record typically like hey i'm swinging for the fences here this is my first single i'm looking for some airplay i'm looking to get some eyes on this thing 
Yeah, I mean, clearly these guys were more interested in the message rather like the message they wanted to deliver rather than the message they think people needed or would like to hear. They were they definitely had something to say, that's for certain. Yeah, Devo really fell into the avant-garde genre of music. Um, I've heard them described as art punk. And and those guys don't care about commercial success. It's really about putting the art forward. Like I, I feel like one of their influences, you know, is kind of Frank Zappa kind of falls into that same regard. Like, you know, Frank Zappa's, you know, very well known, but as far as commercial success, not a whole lot. But yeah, Devo fell right into that that groove. Absolutely. All right, gang. So we've got to figure out if this thing, if this song Mongoloid by Devo killed rock and roll and by extension, did Cleveland kill rock and roll? There's only one way to find out, ladies and germs, and that's through science, proprietary science developed in the lab over 100 episodes. Guys, it consists of five categories. They are gratuitous boomerism excessive misogyny wanton whiteness malignant machismo and culture vulturism we're just going to go around robin here i'll let mark kiss kick it off as he is our guest mark the song is mongoloid the band is devo the album are we not men we are devo the category gratuitous boomerism mark from songs that don't suck listen to your episode the other morning at work Love how you addressed the Spotify changes. I love when you get all data e. It's almost as if you're a data guy. <laughs> yeah, you would you would you would think I, I have some inkling towards data and analytics. Yeah, you're tipping <laughs> your hat, man. Yeah. Um the category gratuitous boomerism, sir, mongoloid. How do you score? So it's really fascinating. I, I am I will admit right here at the top that I am not a huge Devo fan. I will classify myself as an MTV Devo fan. So satisfaction whip it those kind of things so i really had to dive deep and like get into devo when we started talking about doing mongoloid now based on their age i feel like it's kind of the obvious 0.5 based that they are boomers right um the band was formed before i was born and and hell it was formed before my family moved to the united states so they're old very old um and and like on on kind of the basis of the title mongoloid being such a dated term, you'd almost give the other 0.5, but everything I've been reading and kind of researching in the name of science, I don't know if you noticed my new lab coat. It's got, it's got my name on it, except they spelled it with a C. So I'm gonna have to get a Sharpie and put a K on it. But um, Devo was really raising social awareness um, in this song. And I know we'll get into the lyrics here in a bit, but you know, the the word mongoloid was used very early to describe folks who had Down syndrome. And the way that I'm hearing this song, it's like Devo was woke before it was cool. So I feel like I'm going to take away that extra 0.5 and just leave them at 0.5 because they were on another level as far as just accepting people for who they are. And I don't think I can hold the use of a word that was used to describe people who had down syndrome because they, there was no other term until Dr. Down discovered it. So, so yeah, I'm going to give them 0. 0.5 for uh boomerism. Uh, and Mark, I trust that you brought a number two pencil. It's required to be on rock and roll autopsy. Okay. So you're keeping track of your own points. Thank you. I do not possess the intellect necessary to track both my own score and yours as well so i appreciate your preparedness rico the category is gratuitous boomerism how do you score sir yeah um i i, I want to just echo a little bit of mark's words there yeah this this band was uh more interested in expressing their cynicism about the de-evolution of society in their eyes you know which is what you know they came up with the name devo for that reason alone because of you got to think they're coming off of kent state you know and they're coming off of vietnam and and they were college students at that time 
when you are spongy and especially when you're an art student at Kent State, you're definitely of liberal mindset. And so you're definitely going to have some cynicism towards the system and towards the establishment, if you will. And so, yeah, th the way you put it is perfect, man. This band was woke before woke was even woke, you know, and and uh, why would you pick Mongoloid as your first single? Because they had something to say, man, and and they were interested in what they wanted to say. And and I could never penalize a band for that. This song um and and what they're trying to say in this song is just as relevant today as, as at any point in time um certainly in my in my in my eyes um I, we'll get into you know the the term mongoloid more mark mark got into a little bit and that's absolutely true but i i also am going to be giving a, a zero for boomerism because there's nothing of that in this in my opinion uh, the devotion to accuracy department has chimed in and would like to note that uh, Mark Mothersbaugh, who I would say is the, is the leader of the band, is 73 years of age, born in mm. 1950. So firmly ensconced in the uh, realm of boomerism. So I will charge him uh, like Mark did, I believe, with a 0.5. Correct, Mark? For That is correct. For boomerism so i will give that to i will not penalize the entire band i'm sure they're all in the same ballpark age-wise but i will slap mark with that demerit of a 0.5 for his birth year being 1950 the question is do i really it comes down to the term and i like the way uh, you both kind of laid it out it's it is a term that is no longer used there are many other terms that perhaps uh People of a certain age, like ourselves, grew up hearing on the playground that are no longer a part of the uh, dialogue. They have gone the way of the dodo bird and the Betamax, and perhaps rightfully so. Um, so really, it comes down to, are we going to penalize Devo for using uh, this term? I think it was more accepted in the vernacular in its day. Um, so I don't know how provocative it would have been necessarily um, at that time. Um, it certainly is something that definitely raises an eyebrow today. So, oh my goodness. Um, I tell you what, guys, I'm going to score it a one. I'm going to give them a one on this. Um, I see I see what everyone is saying, but I'm just going to... Uh, I'm going to give a little balance here, I guess. And I'm going to be the guy who says, you know what? I, I have no room for it, even with all the artsy fartsy intelligentsia behind it. So let's move on to category two, excessive misogyny. The track is Mongoloid. The band is Devo. And Mark, it's your turn. And I have the lyrics available if you'd like me to read a line or two. Yes, please hit me with your spoken word prose. Mongoloid, he was a mongoloid, happier than you and me. Mongoloid, he was a mongoloid, and it determined what he could see. Mongoloid, he was a mongoloid, one chromosome, too many. Mongoloid, he was a mongoloid, and it determined what he could see. And he wore a hat and he had a job, and he brought home the bacon so that no one knew he was a mongoloid. Mark, do you need any more lyrics? I, I think I'm good. Rico, do you need any more lyrics? I think I have uh, hit my limit on the lyrics. I think I'm good, thanks. Okay. <laughs> All right, Mark, excessive misogyny. How do you score it? So, like, with any deep philosophical lyrical content you really have to peel the onion back to get to the root there's no fucking onion this is like flat here it is there's absolutely zero misogyny um it's just about a dude going to work living his life bringing home bacon and that's it he has a hat like zero <laughs> zero zero for misogyny there's nothing Rico, what say you, sir? Yeah, uh, agree totally. There's not even a, a modicum of hint towards misogyny in this song. Um, it's just, 
you know, it's it's a song about a guy who's just living his life, right? And with regard to um, the term mongoloid, um, see, we have to look at this in today's terms versus at the time, okay? Before the National Association of Down Syndrome was called the National Association of Down Syndrome, it was actually called the, uh, here, I'll bring it up real quick, I had it. It was called... Bear with me here. I had it and lost it. Uh, there it is. Before it was called the National Association of Down Syndrome, it was called the Mongoloid Development Council. Council, and so it was a it was a generally accepted medical terminology for that for what we now call Down Syndrome. Um, and Mothersbaugh even himself in an interview had mentioned that you know parents were contacting him saying that uh, that there were their kids that had down syndrome were actually happy with the song that they were happy that there were songs about them they didn't see it in terms of any kind of derogatory um message or anything like that um so we but in today's society anybody who hears the term mongoloid is just gonna see it as like this awful like mangled horror movie character that's out to get somebody and they're gonna see it in really in a derogatory negative way and and it was never meant to be that even from the very beginning it was just a way to describe us a, um, a medical condition um and so but again we have to look at it in today's terms i'm giving it a zero for misogyny by the way but um yeah that's it i'm done zero for misogyny go ahead scott all right well let's move on to category oh, three you what's gonna score, give a scott? score there buddy Oh my gosh, thank you very much. I have to score for excessive misogyny, don't I? Well, it is a zero. There's no misogyny at all in the song. There's no, it's a sexless song. There's uh, no gender addressed in any way. So I will score it a zero. My goodness, I'm so used to just moving on after uh, after Rico, I guess. But um, let's move on, though. Category three, wanton whiteness. The song is mongoloid and the band is Devo. Mark, what do you say? Uh, I I can't think of a whiter band than Devo. Like, I feel like if I, I cracked open the old Webster's Dictionary and blew the dust off the cover and I looked up white, you know, Devo would be the second definition. <laughs> um, so, uh, I mean. Wait, I should think, I ask what the first definition would be? Uh, Wonder Bread. Oh, gotcha. Okay. <laughs> Um, so I think, I, I, I think you score this a one, right? Like it is as white as white can be. All right, Rico, let's say you, man. Yeah. Um, I think with this band, a band that I personally, I like your description when you say, like we describe them in an avant-garde way. I, I, a band who they really are their own genre. I mean, they don't really fit in. And I think that was part of the problem that they ran into. I think they could have been more popular than they were. It's just the time in which they came out and maybe we'll cover that later on. But a band that I consider um, techno surfer punk is a band that is definitely nothing but white. Um, even if they were just strictly a punk band, they would still be whiter than there's only one black punk band that i am that have ever been aware of we talked about them before band is called death they only have one album they existed for a very short period of time but 99.9 .9 .9 of punk period is white and so even if they were just punk they would be white but then you throw in the techno surfer punk part of it and it's even whiter than white and then those kooky you know robotic outfits with the energy domes dude that's like blazing white for me. So I also am giving them a full one for wanton whiteness. Scott. Uh, if saltine crackers were to start a band, uh, if mayonnaise were to start a band, <laughs> if a bowl of white rice were to start a band, it would be Devo. It is a solid one for wanton whiteness and speaking of whiteness and i feel like this is an appropriate category to address this is rico was talking about the term mongoloid and i don't know that i have 
perfect knowledge here. I, I don't know. I'm reading it from the internet for Christ's sake. So how valuable could it be? But the older I get, and I keep getting older as much as I don't want to, but the older I get, the more I realize that racism, sexism, judgment against literally any marginalized community is just baked in the fucking cake of American history and really world history. And it's really disturbing. Like on Super Bowl Sunday, I don't know why, but I'm on X and I read a long thread about how the Super Bowl is rooted in racism. And it was fascinating. It's like literally everything is somehow touched by humanity's tendency towards ugliness, towards other people. And I don't know how accurate this is, but I was curious about the mongoloid term and I ran into this on song meetings. So I'll just kind of paraphrase it as best I can. But this Dr. Langdon Down, the guy who um, kind of uh, coined the term for Down syndrome, believed it was the result of a genetic de-evolution, which coming from a white perspective, as everything always did forever and always, caused people to take on, quote, mongoloid characteristics with the way the eyes set and they thought of Asians as being less evolved than whites or Caucasians. So this term, even though it was accepted by, you know, like you said, the Down syndrome people called themselves this, like literally everything else in American history or world history, it's rooted in something fucking ugly. And anytime you peel the onion back and look at where history kind of leads you it always goes back to something nasty like this so i kind of tend to believe that maybe this is why the term you know mongolia this asian country right and why we started calling people with down syndrome mongoloids probably was because of appearance and this racist idea that Asians were less evolved. It's pretty fucking ugly. I don't even like saying it, but it makes the term even kind of more problematic, right? Whenever you think about it and wanton whiteness, it's a perfect category for the discussion. I don't know how accurate it is, but I'm throwing it out there, but it's so fucking ugly that it's entirely believable to me. I mean, Jesus, at this point, is there anything that this country is based on that isn't ugly and rooted in ugliness when I mean, you really think about it? I mean, fuck's sake. I think about it all the time anymore. As I get older and you start to like your eyes open and you like uh, just start to kind of reckon with like what it all means around you. I think about this shit all the fucking time, you know, but yeah. I also like and maybe this is just me trying to make a, you know, a. a a virtue out of necessity or whatever the fucking phrase is I'm butchering. But I also think, you know, it's probably true of like every other country in the world. It's just true yeah. of humankind, right? Um, true. Let's move on. Category four, malignant machismo. Mongoloid. Mark, how do you score? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't feel any macho tendencies again with this song. Um, like it's literally a saltine cracker. You're, you, I think that is the best uh, description for Devo and and this song. Like from the content standpoint, like it's literally about just a regular dude. He's not like flexing on the world. He's not like pushing people around. He's just going from A to B, eating bacon. Uh, that feels like the perfect existence for me. I'm going to strive to be that dude <laughs> going forward <laughs> because I want my life to be that simple. So yeah, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to give it a big old zero. Yeah. I mean, good point, dude. I don't think he's knocking on the person, the subject of the song. I think these kind of, I think um, what uh, Jerry Casal and Mothersbaugh um I mean, and this obviously is up for debate, but uh, Mother's Ball himself said that it the the song wasn't really directed at at the the subject of the song. It was directed at everybody around the subject of the song, um, and yeah. it was it was it was generally a compliment that this person is just living their life, and everything around this person is the problem, right? And so, uh, yeah, um, 
machismo god these are a bunch of techno dorks and 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 there's nothing machismo about a bunch of listen mark mothersball went on to write the soundtrack for cloudy with the chance of meatball he did rugrats and you tell me what's macho about that other than it's some goddamn awesome work besides that there's nothing machismo about that if that's a big fat zero for me for sure yeah and sorry to jump back in for just a minute no, you're but good I was thinking about the B-side, and I know we're talking about Mongoloid, but the B-side was Jocko yeah. Homo. Yep. That song was about the people who would generally be bullied by that macho bullshit. So, like, their whole thing was, like, pointing out the the inequity that is the, the white cis male looking down on everybody else. So, yeah, I think you nailed it, Rico. And, and these, guys, these guys are the kids who were beat up by, by those guys. That's I mean, right. I mean, I think we got to pull it back into Northeast Ohio here a little bit. I think another thing that I think is very, not uniquely Northeast Ohio, but it is Midwestern and blue collar is this idea of our main character, the mongoloid, going to work every day and wearing a hat and through conformity, completely fitting in to everyone else around him who is doing the same. And if you think about the world that probably mother's ball grew up in in Akron at that time, you're talking the rubber capital of the world. Everybody has blue collar jobs. These are men going to work and women staying home and the men go and they get dirty and they work in a factory and they do the same thing for 40 years and punch a clock. Right. And then 40 minutes North, they're doing the same thing in Cleveland only instead of rubber, it's steel. Right. And it's just, and it's that world, you know, and that's what, everybody does and that's just what you do in northeast ohio right is it's just mm -hmm. blue collar man lunch pail punching the clock and it's kind of funny to me i was thinking about this today how that's like evolved right because we're gen xers and we saw that of i grew up around men who literally came home dirty every day and worked these jobs right these were the men in my life these were my uncles my neighbors my dad this was the world right we all grew up with that. And we thought, man, I don't want that to be me, man. I don't want to be the guy punching a clock and, and doing that blue collar job. So I got to go to college, right? So we're going to be the generation that goes to college. And now all of us are working in sales or we're working on the web or we're working in like, you know, data. We're all got the white collar, right? We hit it big, right? We did what we, we avoided that what awful existence that our parents had, right? But then our kids are looking at us and they're like, I ain't going to do that. And so what are they? They're influencers. They're YouTubers. They're working for themselves, right? That's the next kind of generational evolution. They're like, I ain't going to be like my Gen X parents and work for the man. I'm going to do my own thing and carve my own path. And so that's where Zs and millennials are going, right? So it's just yep. this idea of societal conformity and generationally all doing the same thing. And then the other idea of, and that was the macho thing to do, right? Malignant machismo. We're men. We go to work. We punch the clock. And meanwhile, you're the real idiot because you never unplugged from the matrix, you know? And so we're the, we're the real dummies, not the guy that you're calling the mongoloid who is supposed to be of lesser intelligence, right? The real idiots are the ones, like Rico said, around the main character who are just going through the motions and living the same life over and over and over again every day right so malignant machismo i'm giving it a zero come on man devo were the kids who were being beat up every day in in akron ohio all right let's move on culture vulturism mark what say you sir so i mentioned at the beginning of the autopsy that uh devo's in that avant-garde genre um art punk is what i think wikipedia refers to them as and with any of the avant-garde artists of that time, they all kind of borrowed from each other. You'll, you'll get, you know, things here and there, but this is also an extremely creative class of musicians where they're going to take that and then they're going to put their own artistic spin on it and then push it out to the world. Like, I can't think of another band that sounds like Devo. Um, I can hear influences. Like I mentioned, Frank Zappa. Um, Pear Ubu, like those types of bands, they all kind of played together and, and knew each other. Um, so I feel like it might be a 0.5, but uh, it, it really, 
I, I don't think it was vulturism. So you know what? I'm actually gonna I'm gonna rescind that. I'm gonna give them a zero for vulturism. I think they're working within the bounds of the avant-garde genre, um, doing what avant-garde artists do and creating their own art based on their influences and inputs around them. So yeah, zero from me. Rico, what say you, sir? Yeah. <clears throat> um this came out in 1977 and if you think about what else came out in 1977 that was kind of like in the heat of classic rock and some people were in their proggy phase like rush was in their proggy phase and yes was popular then and bands like foreigner and sticks and a little bit of piano rock like Elton John and Billy Joel and all that stuff in Queen, all that stuff was going on in, in the, in that time period. And then you have Devo Devo fit into the late seventies, like Primus fit into 1991. They're a band that was just misplaced. They're a band that is their own genre that you could pick out of a million bands. You could listen to Devo and it's like, that's Devo. They are so, and, and I totally agree with you, Mark. You can certainly hear influences. I mean, you know, they didn't just invent this stuff. You know what I mean? You can, they, they are clearly influenced by other musicians, but what they managed to do was so completely unique. And, and I'll go as far to say is because they came out in 77 as well known as as they were and are going to be now that this documentary is coming out this is going to revive them for sure because that's the way it works I, I certainly wholeheartedly feel that they were just ahead of their time had they done this three or four years later they would have been in the upper stratosphere of elite st superstardom. Like four years in music is a lot. That's the difference between Help and Abbey Road or Help and, and the White Album. That's three or four years. That's the difference between 77 and 81 is Help versus the White Album, if you're talking the Beatles. So if you take this single and, and, and the album, Are We Not Men, We Are Diva, and you put it in 1981 or even 1980 instead of 1977 these guys would be freaking superstars even more than they than they were famous than they wound up ever being and so yeah they're, they're completely unique there's no vulturism here they get a flat zero for me for sure yeah i agree man they gotta get a zero for me i mean these are guys who often don't even play traditional instruments i mean they're just taking like a freaking speaking spell and rewiring it like et to try to come up with some <laughs> weird sounds you know what i mean so it's like these guys are definitely outside the box thinkers and i frankly am proud to have them from northeast ohio because i think they're they're quirky but cool and unique um artistic not i'm like mark i'm an mtv fan even growing up in the area you weren't surrounded by devo music you were surrounded by you know fog hat but you weren't surrounded by devo music you know what i mean but so i knew them from mtv i knew the singles but i enjoy now going back and listening to these songs that i wasn't familiar with and learning about this kind of super important band from our hometown i am going to score it a zero as well i think we've come to the point of the autopsy where we've got to do some arithmetic so get your shoes and socks off ladies and germs we got a math mark what have you got sir <laughs> I have easy math tonight. I only have 1.5. Do we know the threshold tonight? Do we know what? Well, what... you're the one that helped us out with that. So can you remind everybody the three-person scoring system here? I think it was 13. 13. Okay, 13. So 13 and up, killed rock. Got yeah. you. Thank you for reminding everybody out in the universe our three-person scoring system. All right, Rico, Mark, I've got a two. And all right, let me see here. I've got 489 divided by five. Carry the five. I've got 1.0. 1 1.0. For a grand total of 4.5. Wow.
not even close. No. Not even close. This song was super great. The entire album is great, actually. These guys are really underrated as musicians. If you listen to this album, pay attention to that. They're a lot better than they lead on from a music from a musical standpoint. This song contributed to rock, Scott. It did not kill rock, and it wasn't even just kind of there, dude. Science, as usual, works again. And Devo was inducted into the Rock Hall in 2010 to bring it all the way back around. Thank you. As uh, absolutely deserved, in my opinion. Absolutely. Quick note from the Devotion to Accuracy Department. Devo are not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I repeat, not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Uh, any other thoughts, gentlemen? Uh, Devo, I mean, we're going to talk about, this is going to be an ongoing series. We've got five episodes planned. We'll pepper them throughout the year so we don't, uh, you know, overextend Mark. He's already got his hands full uh, running songs that don't suck. But um, I don't know, guys. We'll find out, I guess, where Devo kind of fits in to the, uh, you know, the Mount Rushmore plus one of uh, Cleveland rock and roll. At the end of the Did Cleveland Kill Rock, it'll be interesting to kind of aggregate all of the scores to see if Cleveland actually did kill rock or if we're making it thrive. Like I personally believe. Ooh, we are. ooh, yeah. So so yeah, why don't we do that? So so let's assign a like a score to if they if where they wound up in the score. So they contributed to rock. So we've got contributed, nothing, and killed rock. So we can go like zero point five and one, right? Yeah. For our did it kill did Cleveland kill rock? So for this episode, since they contributed, they get as this episode gets a zero. I think. And so. at the and at the end of the series, we'll tally it up and see did Cleveland kill rock? So so far, this episode gets a zero, right? I love it. I, I can only say one thing, and that I don't know what's killed rock and roll, but I can say that my dog is killing my nose right now because <laughs> I have the most flatulent animal sharing this office space with me. He gets a bark box every month. You guys know what a bark box is? Yeah. And in it, there's usually it's usually themed, and then in it, this month of Valentine's, of course. So you get some chew toys, then you get some chewies, like some snacks, a couple bags of snacks, and then he gets like what they call a super chewer, which is like his bone that he gets. Holy hell! Every once in a while, they toss something in there that just makes him the most flatulent canine on the planet. And I am gonna asphyxiate if we protract this podcast episode any longer. Well, now you know how the rest of your family feels about you. <laughs> so they're going to cut off your BarkBox subscription for the same reason. Or they're just going to make you stop eating the dog snacks. One of the two. <laughs> True. <laughs> All right, gang. Well, it's been fun. Cleveland rocks. And it's been Rock and Roll Autopsy. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Rico. Good night now. Let me have that special rock and roll music. Yeah. Let me tell you, so the lyrics to real rock music is nothing more than satanic cyanide. Get it out of your house, throw it out, and burn it. It has no place in the house of the righteous. You guys, it was like a mistake. There's no mistake anymore. To the dawn, love it hey, to the morning. Yeah, I'm gone. <laughs> I'm gone. Follow us on Twitter at RNR Autopsy, or you can send an email to rock and roll autopsy at gmail.com. And if we run across anything good, we'll mention it in a future episode. Thanks for listening. Later. Well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. Before you go, if you like heavy metal and stories, 
then you'll love Battle of the Bands, the narrative form metal podcast that unpacks the biggest rivalries in rock and metal history. Season 1 took in Megadeth versus Metallica, and Season 2 went across the divide to explore the beef between Judas Priest and Iron Maiden. It's like Business Wars, but metal. Find Battle of the Bands wherever you listen to your podcasts or visit battleofthebandspod.com. All right, guys. That was fun. Thanks. That was had a good time. I, I say that was that was very educational, very deep. Like I, I enjoyed that. Well, listen. Maybe next time we'll try to be more juvenile to keep up with uh, our I, usual. We, we, we had no uh food detours. <laughs> we had no no wet ass pussy. I mean, no f- other than the. Oh dog my gosh! It's. End. I mean, like, dude, uh, dude, are we losing our fastball already? It was. Yeah. It was the fucking cleanest episode that. Oh exists. my gosh, Mark! You've elevated the intellect of the podcast. You are never welcome back again. Ew. We are completely off brand. <laughs> no, no, we can't have that. I'm supposed to be emotionally twelve on this podcast. Okay. <laughs> oh, right. damn. stop it! Stop making me a grown up. Um, All right. Well, listen, gentlemen, I'm going to go beat <laughs> off and go to bed. That's a good idea. I might join you. <laughs> um, no. Do it, do it, no, just do it by yourself. We already sat on your lap. The, the you know, just... <laughs> And that wasn't a banana in my pocket either. Hey, now. All right. Good night, guys. Good night.